South Sudan's President Salva Kiir accuses current and former senior officials of stealing at least $4 billion in state funds. In a letter to those he suspects of taking the money, he says, we fought for freedom, justice and equality. Yet, once we got to power, we forgot what we fought for and began to enrich ourselves at the expense of our people. Is this sort of corruption inevitable and who is to blame? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rida Fakhri. In a letter that reveals the depth of government corruption, South Sudan's President Salva Kiir is asking more than 75 former and current government officials to return about $4 billion in stolen public money. The president says the credibility of South Sudan is on the line, but he's also promising an amnesty and confidentiality for anyone who returns embezzled funds. Kiir says the government has set up a special bank account in Kenya where officials can deposit the money they took. South Sudan is desperately in need of money. Oil production accounts for 98% of its revenues. But a dispute with the government of Sudan shut down production earlier this year. So a difficult economic situation, further compounded by the fact that documents from the World Bank warned last month of possible state collapse if South Sudan runs out of foreign exchange reserves, which it said could be depleted by July. According to a previously released report by the South Sudanese Auditor General, over a billion U.S. dollars from oil revenues was unaccounted for during 2005-2006. The Auditor General's report also indicated that for two consecutive years, there was no financial reporting of what happened to non-oil revenues that were collected in taxes by the national government or states. Billions more were feared missing between 2007 and 2011. And millions of dollars were reportedly smuggled out of South Sudan in bags across borders to unknown destinations. So who then is to blame for the corruption in South Sudan and what should be done? To answer these questions, we're joined by Barnaba Marielle Benjamin, South Sudan's information minister who's in Juba. In Washington, Jonathan Temin, director of the Sudan program at the United States Institute of Peace. And in London, Professor Paul Moorcraft, director of the Center for Foreign Policy Analysis. Barnaba Benjamin in Juba, Silva Kier says corruption has no place in his government. How is it then that such massive scale corruption was allowed to go on for so long, even though there was ample sign that it had been taking place for a while? Uh, first of all, let us clear the issue of funds. The issue of funds, this was funds which were related to the purchase of grain strategic reserve in which over 780 companies were contracted uh, to buy grain in order for reserve, for strategic reserve. Uh, some of these companies, it is expected that some of them delivered the grains to various states and, uh, and other companies were suspected not to have delivered the grain deliveries. That may account for some of, of that, the money, uh, uh, Mr. The government, Benjamin, but we're talking about $4 billion, which this, could not possibly have gone missing overnight. The, yes. this. No, no, this it is not missing overnight. Can I finish what I would like to say to clarify it? That this was meant for grain reserve, which was supposed to go to contracted 780 companies. So the government suspected because some cases were found to have delivered the grain, others were found not to have delivered. That's why the government created that some senior officials must have cooperated with some of these companies, particularly those bogus companies that did not deliver the strategic grain reserve. That's why the president, through the Anti-Corruption Commission, has written to various senior government officials. And first, the first thing which was done was sending out forms to declaration, for declaration of assets to over 5,000 senior government officials throughout South Sudan. And after that, some senior officials were written in case some of these funds, which were meant for the strategic grain reserve, uh, cooperated with some of these companies that this money was supposed for them to purchase grain. And that's why the president had to send out these letters, not that they were suspecting these officials, but in case some of them must have cooperated and facilitated some of this money to be filtered off to some of these companies. I think that needs to be clarified. 
Professor uh, Moorcraft, what do you make? If, I, if like I can just stop you here for a brief moment, uh, Professor Moorcraft, what do you make of this explanation? By writing a letter like this, can President Silva here absolve himself of ultimate responsibility? Can he take the moral high ground and simply cast the blame on his long-term colleagues? Well, it'll be interesting to know how much uh, Salva Kiir has in his own bank account. Uh, we're not sure about that. A lot of the leaders, so they say in South Sudan, have put money away. But this is damage limitation. What has happened is in January, the government cut off the oil, 98% of its uh, income, which is absolutely crazy, and suddenly a few months later said, we haven't got any money. And the IMF, as you say, has said that they, there will be state collapse next month. So suddenly they're saying, right, we need to get money from our old donors, from the EU, from America, but they don't have much money. So this is, this is a public relations exercise. There's been $17 billion, which has gone since 2005 to Juba. Where is it all? There are hardly any roads. It's been spent on arms. So it's been corruption, diversion of money into arms, uh, fat cat guys putting money in bank accounts, and now they're saying pay it back into Kenya, the one country where there's tremendous corruption as well. The whole thing is PR, and nobody's going to be persuaded by this. Jonathan Temen, who can help Silva Kier now? He obviously needs help. He sent some eight letters to heads of states, including the President of the United States. Uh, should he be asking for foreign help, or should he be taking the kinds of decisive action that, that ensure that this type of massive uh, uh, corruption doesn't take place in the future, and prosecute and hold those who've taken part in this accountable, at the very least? I think the biggest economic help that South Sudan could get right now would be to strike a deal with Sudan on oil revenue sharing, and those negotiations are just getting underway, resuming in Addis Ababa and Ethiopia. If the oil can get back online using the existing pipelines and there's some sort of sharing deal, uh, that can hugely help the cash flow. Um, and as was just pointed out, they are probably about to run out of cash. Uh, to the earlier point, I think the grain scandal is certainly a big part of the corruption story. Uh, the estimates I've seen concerning the grain scandal are probably about $2 billion lost. So I don't think that that's all of the story. Uh, clearly, there are high levels of corruption throughout South Sudan. And so if there is that kind of endemic corruption, Barnaba Benjamin, does the president's uh, strategy then look like the best long-term strategy to deal with this? Or is it short-sighted at best, naive, perhaps many would say at worst? The fact that he has offered amnesty, immunity for those who would return the money in return for confidentiality as well. I mean, is this the way you build a democratic state? Uh, first of all, the, the Republic of South, South Sudan has a, a wonderful constitution that is based on democratic basis. Uh, the, f the fact raised that there were 17 billion of dollars transferred during the interim period by the, f by the second speaker, I would disagree with them. These are the statistics supplied by Khartoum, which actually took most of our oil money. Uh, secondly, the oil shutdown is not by the Republic of South Sudan. The oil was already shut down by the policies adopted by the government of the Republic of Sudan that prevented the export of our oil and it started to steal our own oil. And therefore, there was no oil already coming even before the shutdown because most of our oil was already taken over by Bashir. So our, we were actually back to the wall and there was no way we could have allowed our oil to flow when we would not get not even a dollar out of it. I think this should be made clear because the, the shutdown was not just a mad and crazy shutdown as said by the second speaker. Secondly, the government of the Republic of South Sudan is handling this issue in a very responsible manner. Already now the World Bank is calculating the liability that the government of the Republic of South Sudan has sustained through this loss. And the results that have come out are encouraging indeed uh, because the issues of capacities and others where the accounting system might have not gone right will later on come out as, a, as, as the truth in, in unfolds itself. I can assure you the Anti-Corruption Commission is doing a wonderful job. I think we'll be the first country in this world, I can tell you, uh, we may not reach the stage of corruption in the West or anywhere in the world here. The steps that we have taken indicate that this young republic is moving on a diplomatic manner that will actually control and will solve the problem of corruption once and for all. We are the only country in the world that actually locked up a minister because of a corruption. They cannot quote me one single country 
whether in the West or in the East or in Africa, but, that but at has the same time, Mr. Minister, Mr. Benjamin, at the same time, if you've corruption. got 75, so if you've got, forgive me for interrupting, but if 75 percent of your senior current and former officials are involved no. in this type of embezzlement, the president, the president, surely by granting them no, amnesty, the you're sending the wrong this, message, aren't you? I mean, no, and you talk about the no, anti-corruption commission. This, if you allow me to, to continue, what kind of teeth that does this uh, letters, commission have if it cannot These people prosecute? are not suspect. Can we correct it? These letters written to these 75 senior political leaders are not suspect. Can I clarify that? So why, were the, why were the letters then addressed of the to them? The letters were written because, because of the fact that so many companies were involved. So the, the government is thinking senior officials might have made it easy for these people to take this money. That's why the president is asking if anybody had benefited from this type of money, he should actually write to him in confidence to declare that it was, they were, he was not suspecting these individuals. That, that is not true. We, we, we need to clarify that. Uh, Professor uh, Moorcraft, why would anyone stop taking part in, in corrupt dealings if there is no punishment, if there is no public shaming, in, in essence? Will any foreign investors sure. take South Sudan seriously? And you've just mentioned how uh, desperately in need of foreign money and foreign uh, currency Sudan is if there is this kind of rampant endemic corruption that continues? Well, there's a number of reasons to uh, disincentives for investment. I mentioned the oil, which had been turned off. It's, I can't just suddenly turn it on again. It takes at least six months to get the pipelines running. The fighting in Heglige uh, on both sides caused it, uh, destroying some of the infrastructure. That doesn't make sense. The fact that the Juba government is saying, oh, well, it can build alternative pi pipelines down through the south, that'll take three to five years and cost billions. And who's going to invest in it? Who's going to insure it? So there are lots of problems of credibility. I mean, I, the, I'll give you an example for the referendum uh, of last year. Uh, there were hundreds of foreign journalists, many of them extremely well disposed to the New Republic. And the government openly made it almost impossible to register, and you had to go to four different places. You had to pay $100 here, $100 there. It was absolutely extortionate and disorganized, and despite the fact that the UN advisors were there and said, don't charge foreign correspondents $100 for this, $100 for that. It was sheer extortion right at the start of the process. Now, the government is corrupt from top to bottom. I wish it well, but nobody in the West or America is going to say, right, you've spent all this money. Uh, you've wasted it in a large extent. Put it in Switzerland. We're not going to give you more aid when there's going to be a shortage of food or famine, especially as the grain has gone. Jonathan Temin, and was this type of uh, urging uh, uh, South Sudan to become independent, to secede uh, from Sudan proper, was this uh, short-sighted in the end, without capacity, without proper institutions, without the kinds of checks and balances that were needed? Was this bound to happen? No, I don't think so, and I think that's too harsh a criticism. The people of South Sudan very clearly expressed their strong desire to be independent through the referendum, which was a peaceful and very impressive process in the end. But it does show the growing pains of a new country, and certainly there have been missteps in the new country. We need to remember, too, they are still uh, living in a hostile environment. There is still conflict with Sudan to the north. That doesn't explain all these problems, and too often that conflict is used as an excuse. But it is too soon to write the story of this new country. It's not even one year old. I think we should revisit that kind of a question in five or ten years. But Barnaba Benjamin, would you agree, though, that proper steps should have been taken when there were clearly signs of this type of corruption that dated back to at least to 2005, when the Auditor General found that for that uh, fiscal year, $1.5 billion had gone missing. Is this, in a sense, a classic case of putting the cart before the horse, of not building the institutions, yes, the kind of framework that you needed before deciding to become independent? Yes, that $1.5 billion was traced to Khartoum to have filtered up, not the Republic of South Sudan. We would like to make that very clear. And the Transparency International has records for that. Secondly, as a young state, I can assure you what we have done in nine months and how we are moving as a young democratic country is something what anybody that visits this country can see. And I would like the first, the second speaker, if he could ever visit Juba, uh, and he will notice that this country is here to say it will contribute its bit to the African Union and to the United Nations, I can assure you that. The fact that we are facing the issue of uh, corruption 
facing face on is an indication this young country is serious to put its records right within a period of one year. And all the, the, the records that were mentioned during the referendum, there was no element of corruption. It was an exercise which was praised throughout the whole world. Uh, so I believe this is, uh, this is a challenge, I, I agree. But it's a challenge that we will surmount at the end of the day. Paul Moorcraft, it all obviously started with a lot of hope. But if so many people at the highest levels of power are embezzling this amount of money, I mean, doesn't it cast a long shadow? over Sudan's future, it, its good governance, its potential for democracy? Uh, I wish South Sudan all the best. I understand its freedom fight for 50 years, the longest war in Africa, and they achieved freedom after great oppression. But that doesn't mean the great freedom fighters should become public looters, is what has happened. Uh, good fighters, maybe, good guerrilla leaders, but not good politicians. And even though it's a new country, the corruption is endemic. And until now, at the very last minute, when the country's about to run out of money, uh, the president decided to do something too little, too late. Uh, also, it's no good just simply blaming North, North Sudan. Yes, they're a threat. Yes, they've been up to all sorts of things. But it's like the other countries in Africa blaming colonialism or in the South blaming apartheid. Juba cannot continue just to blame everything in Khartoum. It must look at itself and say, yes, we've been involved in high-level corruption, which has been endemic and widespread. And they must look at the senior leaders, because the press has been censored. Those in the, in the press who have been investigating what's happening have been controlled. We need to know what leaders, senior leaders in the party, what are their records? What money have they salted abroad? And how much of that money is going to come back? Barnaba Benjamin then, ultimately, does Silva Kier bear responsibility for this ongoing situation? I mean, does he have to make, take, take a firm decision, a firm stance on this? Either he parts ways with corrupt officials or he does nothing I about it so. and risks uh, dragging South Sudan into a messy situation with no accountability. I can assure you the President Silva Kier is conducting a very responsible leadership in this country. It's a leadership of, of liberators who are also knowledgeable about the political situation. I can assure you of that. The steps that have been taken are appropriate. And as we speak now, because the Anti-Corruption Commission has already sent us reports, that up to now we have already recovered about 60 million US dollars from some of the, the companies and some of the, of the officials where some of this money had gone into. I think the approach is absolutely correct. And as I said, uh, there is no running out of cash or running out of money, as stated by the other speaker. I can assure this country uh, will continue to manage. And already today, we have just passed an austerity budget, uh, which is going to keep us going until we put, until the one day when our oil begins to run under our own control. But, but how uh, appropriate, though, Mr. That Benjamin? There is tremendous future. Just, just how appropriate, though, is it for the president to step into this, to take action politically? on an issue that should be an issue of, of public funds, uh, on an issue that should obviously concern the Justice Department, uh, law enforcement. I mean, and some uh, people might even argue this, that this, he this is this in is breach of the very constitution he was sworn in to uphold, that Article 101, in fact, does not give him the authority to grant immunity to potential criminals. This process was started since 2009 and 2010 in which investigations was carried out. The Minister of Finance by then was arrested and put into jail with some senior officials in the Minister of Finance. The issue was investigated. It went to the Parliament. The Parliament in de uh, pa debated it and passed a bill that a sensitive investigation must be carried out. So the advice was given by the system uh, to the President. It was not just a decision by the President. There is a system, an organized system, that issues which, which, uh, which emanate from uh, crime as it is, are conducted in a manner that reflects the democratic society that we are in. And I think the method adopted by the president will be able to bear fruits. And as I said, now we just passed today, as I speak to you, our austerity budget for 10, 2012 to 2013. So there is no really uh, issue, the issues of uh, cash, cash running out of money. That is, that is not possible. We are aware of the fact that we have closed down the oil as a result of the actions of the Khartoum regime, uh, which wanted we were stealing our oil and giving us exorbitant charges to pay the transit fees, which is just expensive, that we couldn't just afford to, to pay that type of fees. So I believe uh, that there are many countries on planet Earth uh, that run their countries without having oil. 
And as long as our resources are there, and the peace that we are negotiating in Addis Ababa now, I'm sure we will resolve most of these issues. Obviously, a lot of challenges Khartoum facing, and, and, facing and Juba. But uh, Jonathan Temin, if I can turn to you just briefly, if the president knows exactly who was behind this, uh, and we are led to believe that he sent 75 letters to officials he believe, be believes are concerned here, why doesn't he then deal decisively with this? I mean, does he really need to be sending letters to this and that government, or could he take decisive action? After all, he has ruled essentially by presidential decree. Can't he just demand uh, that some of these officials he suspects of corruption resign their post, that, uh, that, that people with cleaner backgrounds take over, that some kind of a cleaner foundation is set for the future of people who still have hopes for South Sudan within the country itself? I think that would be very politically difficult for the president. Some of the senior officials are powerful people in their own right. Uh, they are powerful given ethnic dynamics and regional dynamics in the country, and they are powerful because of what they have fought for uh, and sacrificed during the many years of the war. Uh, so that would not be an easy thing for the president to do. What I do want to highlight is the importance of this anti-corruption commission that the minister mentioned. It has not been terribly effective in the past few years. There's a new head of the commission, a former judge, and so we'll see if he's able to be more effective than the last head of the commission. But it ultimately is the kind of accountability that you're talking about that is going to make a difference. We haven't seen that kind of accountability so far. Let's see if the new head of the Anti-Corruption Commission can try to deliver it. And of course, all of this against the backdrop uh, of South Sudan economy, which is fragile and still underdeveloped. 98% of its revenues come from oil, but the abrupt shutdown of production caused by the dispute with Sudan has severely constrained economic growth. South Sudan is considered to have the worst social and economic indicators in the world. Annual inflation shot up to nearly 80% in May. The latest average GDP per capita is 3,000 US dollars, which puts it at 172 in the world ranking. Around 70% of the people are illiterate. According to a recent survey, one out of every seven children dies in infancy. There is only one doctor for every 500,000 people in some regions, and more than 90% of the people in South Sudan live on less than one dollar a day. So these indicators highlight the grave economic challenges the world's newest nation is facing less than a year after gaining independence. Mr. Benjamin, then, when you look back at all this, was it, was it worthwhile to seek independence and secession, or perhaps was the vision of leaders like John Garang the, the more appropriate course of action for South Sudan, looking back now in hindsight? Uh, the ways in democratic societies, the way things are resolved is through the right of self-determination for a people to decide their future. The people of the Republic of South Sudan voted 90, nearly 99% for a state of their own. And as I said, uh, the state is, is actually facing challenges that it is surmounting them, is resolving them. The issue of the rises of prices, uh, the food prices, of course, they rise everywhere. And I'm sure the government has tackled it uh, with the result of the essential commodities that come in into this country. The government had just released over a hundred million dollars in order to resolve the issue of the imports of food items into the Republic of South Sudan. In the little time that I have left on the program, I want to ask Professor Moorcraft about whether or not this type of optimism is well-founded and well-placed. When you look back at the South Sudanese people's right for self-determination, do you see it as a, a, an indigenous African effort, or was it somehow pushed by Western powers as a way to, to weaken Sudan, Khartoum, as a way to as well try to reap the benefits that South Sudan had to offer? You must remember that some of the early leaders, like John Garang, wanted the whole of Sudan to stay united and reform the country from within. Uh, and there were people who opposed him who wanted separation. And uh, anybody can understand the fact that the South definitely was oppressed religiously and politically and so forth. And that doesn't mean that we should accept that the present government, which is basically a, a military uh, posing as a political movement, and there's very little opposition in Parliament, uh, it is a dominant, it's a bit like Robert Mugabe's party, where you've got a guerrilla leader who still continues to rule as a, as a statesman. That's what's happened in the South. There's not much democracy, not much opposition. The papers are 
newspapers are censored. So I don't really buy all this glorious democracy and so forth. I wish it well. I wish it were less corrupt. And I wish it hadn't have turned off the oil. That just didn't make, you know, didn't make sense. I don't buy what he's saying, but the North, uh, they, it's better to have some money from oil than nothing. Because I repeat my point. Where is the money going to come from? Uh, it's, you know, is, is it going to come from aid agencies? Is it going to come from America? There's compassion fatigue in the West. So in many of the issues, many of the problems have been brought on the government by its own poor performance. Yes, there are problems with ethnicity, problems with development, but much of it is their own blame. And they should look at themselves and say, we're to blame. Let's put this right. Let's not blame everybody, including the North. Much more to discuss, but we'll have to leave it there. Thanks to our guests in Juba, Barnaba, Mariel Benjamin in Washington, D.C., Jonathan Temin, and in London, Paul Moorcraft. And thank you very much, of course, for joining us for this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your feedback, as always. You can email us your thought at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. I'm Rida Fakhri. Thanks for watching.